Um, today, I, I'd, I'd like to continue with, uh, with stuff that we discussed yesterday. But I'd like to also talk a little bit about cluster state quantum computation because it's an interesting idea. And it's not clear whether it somehow really naturally exploits uh, the fact that, uh, that we get entanglement for free in many physical systems. With, with, with the small print issues that we tried to discuss yesterday, whether you call this real entanglement and so on. So I'll, I'll, I'll talk about it uh, today as well. But, but to, just to, to summarize yesterday's discussion, we had a Hamiltonian for a many body system, and I, I claim that this captured many types of systems. Could be fermionic, bosonic, could be distinguishable particles in a, in a typical magnetic system. So somehow anything you do in solid state conforms to this kind of logic. And the idea is that you've got some kind of um, uh, two, so two body interaction is, is the most natural given that it's very unlikely that three particles will simultaneously localize in the same place and interact. It just comes from that. I mean, you know, three particle interaction and higher is included if you expand perturbatively the Hamiltonian, you will get the extra terms. But then will be highly unlikely to happen, or less and less likely. So some two body interaction is, is typical. And then, usually we talk about short-range coupling um, for various reasons. Even if, even if these are, even if these are uh, charged particles that couple by electromagnetic field, which everyone knows is infinite range, if you like, it's long range, uh, you still have usually some kind of screening effects in, in complex systems where charges arrange themselves in such a way that even a long-range interaction becomes a short-range interaction. So the Hamiltonian really is well justified. It captures more or less all uh, many body phases that you can imagine. So then I said that there are two parts. Usually you try to introduce some kind of uh, coupling between these guys. I think yesterday I had uh, uh, XX and YY exchange Hamiltonian, but you can put ZZ. It just becomes a little bit harder to, to solve these, uh, these guys. And yes, people have been extending this um, to, um, to next to nearest neighbors and so on, but, but usually all of these have very similar features as long as they're short range, finite, finite range, if you like. And then there was an external magnetic field, which I said uh, could, be, could be chosen in whatever is your z direction in the, in the lab. Um, now, the third parameter that determines the behavior is the temperature. If, if you talk about disordered systems, then what people do is they introduce some kind of noise on top of the B field and the J field as well. Um, so you are never really in a pure state. You're never really in an eigen state of this Hamiltonian. What you are is you always have some fluctuations on top of this. So it's very similar to the effect of temperature. And you can capture it with very similar methods, actually, if you, if you allow J to vary from side to side and to have some kind of Gaussian distribution on top of it telling you about noise and so on. So all of this can be included and is usually done. The, the, the summary of, of, of all of these results is basically that at some stage, and I think I'll give you a very simple example, the easiest thing is really just to take two spins, and you will see all the features of n spins even in these two spins. Um, but the summary of this was that at some, at some stage, these uh, parameters will be in the right range for you to start to see many body entanglement. Um, and the right range was, was simply that, uh, uh, you know, if you plot it in the, in the 2D plot with the temperature versus magnetic field and, and B uh, versus, uh, sorry, the magnetic field versus coupling and temperature versus coupling, then it looks something like that. Um, and, and basically this is roughly one, if you like. Uh, and it says, it says this, this region definitely has entanglement. Um, I mentioned yesterday that probably there is a region here beyond which you definitely don't have entanglement. There is no formal proof of this statement um, in general. Uh, but I think everyone, everyone expects that there will be some kind of gap uh, between these guys which will not be easily able to close un unless you can find a better witness than the one I was, uh, I was presenting uh, yesterday. So if the magnetic field is too strong or if the temperature is too strong, then of course it's clear that you will ultimately have to reach some kind of separable state. That's obvious. Um, so, you know, there is a bound. It's just a question of what is a good bound, uh, what is a meaningful bound. So if you look at a very simple example of a, of a, of a two, um, it's just really all of these features, you know, people keep talking about a thermodynamical limit. Um, 
of course, there is no thermodynamical limit in nature. You always have a finite number of particles. It's just that certain features are defined only in the thermodynamical limit. But I think all of them are already visible in the two, uh, in the two uh, qubit case. So if you think about, I'm just going to put the shorthand notation. So this is the same as, um, as, the, as the xx plus yy plus zz now written as, as vectors between 1 and 2. And then I'm going to have some magnetic field in the z direction for 1, and let's assume the same magnetic field in the z direction for 2. This would be like a diamond, um, two spin half scaffold, and you could have many copies if you like. And so without the B field, um, you've got the typical single triplet splitting in this Hamiltonian. So if the B field is 0, you've got a, you've got a degeneracy in your, in your symmetric subspace. So basically the, the um, the ground state, uh, in this case, will be will be the singlet state, um, and and why do we know that? It's, it's without I mean, you know, the easiest is really just to expand this. If you're not comfortable with this kind of logic, just write it as a four by four Hamiltonian matrix, diagonalize it, and you will get this. Uh, it's, it's very easy to it's more diagonal, so it's easy to diagonalize. But basically, the singlet state simply picks up a minus j value for each of these x, x, y, y, and z, z. I mean, singlet state is completely rotationally invariant. So whether I measure x, x, or y, y, or z, z makes no difference. I always get minus 1 value. And, and so that, that's why the energy is just minus 3j. So it's got to be like that. You don't have to calculate it. And then the triplet is, is there, it's degenerate, and then it's sitting at the value j. Um, and so this includes state 0, 0, 1, 1, and the 0, 1 plus 1, 0. Of course, when they're degenerate, you can expand in any linear combination of these guys. But I'm choosing these guys because they are the ones that are going to split when I leave the degeneracy in the, in the B, so when I introduce the B field. So obviously, at zero temperature, I'm highly entangled. And if you think of this guy as your witness, it's going to pick it up. Because, because the, the, the expectation value of this matrix with respect to separable states, can never exceed one. <laughs> because separable states di divide themselves into an average of sigma, and the other sigma, each of them is at most one, and therefore I cannot exceed one. You know what I'm saying? I mean, it's just as simple as that. At, at most is equal to one. Um, it's like a shorthand proof of, of what I showed before. But singlet state already does three times better than that. So it's clearly highly entangled. Um, and if you're starting to introduce the temperature now, you can see that you're starting to populate these higher states. And at some stage, in fact, when kT equals j, you will have enough population in the upper state, in some sense, that you will if your temperature is very high, then it's clear that you're mixing them all equally, likely. And then, of course, a mixture of all of these guys is, a, is an identity matrix. It's completely uh, disentangled. There are no correlations. But even less than that is enough to give you this critical point. It's either 2j or j, something like that. Okay? Now, what happens when I, when, I, when I introduce the B field? Um, so now B, B uh, starting to, to increase. Is that, is that one of those um, states which is aligned with the B field starts to become energetically more and more favorable. Uh, the other one, the triplet, uh, the entangled component doesn't see it because the B field is exactly canceled. Uh, one points up, the other one points down, so it's B minus B if you like. There is no overall effect on energy. Whereas the one that's anti-aligned starts to pick up a positive energy. So it's, it's being penalized for, for being in the opposite direction, if you like. And so basically the state, the state 0, 0 starts to go down in terms of energy. So this guy now has energy J minus 2B. Um, minus 2B because, because each of the spins picks up a value B. Um, this guy like I said, starts to go up in value j plus 2b, and this guy doesn't care about, about the b field at all. It stays the same. And, and now you can see that, that when b is equal to um, j over 2, so 
So I, I think because of this funny factor too, people like to put half here to put them on an equal footing, so to twice the J. So J equal, e really equals B is, is the critical point. But in my example now is, is, is J over 2, if you like, B equals J over 2. You will see that this guy is simply going to, going to overtake the, well, no, sorry, it still has to reach minus 3J. I was right, actually, I'm okay with that. So basically, when this value, J minus 2B, becomes equal to minus 3J, then basically, then basically you've got uh, you've got uh, you've got the critical point when you have degeneracy of the ground state, and if you exceed this point, uh, then you will have you will have a separable state as your as your ground state. Okay. So here is a simple. This is what people incidentally. This is what people call a quantum phase transition. So the jargon in the solid state community. It's a little bit archaic. It's a bit funny sometimes inconsistent is that when I'm changing the temperature then I'm talking about ordinary phase transitions some people even call them classical even though of course this is quantum mechanical you can't explain this classically but when you're at zero temperature you're not changing the temperature but you're changing some other parameter like the external magnetic field people talk about this as a quantum phase transition and there are books written on quantum phase transitions okay such that probably is the most famous one and so here, quantum phase transition occurs when, when B is equal to, uh, to 2J. Okay? So B critical is twice J. And at that point, you have a degeneracy between, between, there is a competition, if you like, between these two states. And if you imagine what a natural system will do, as you cool it down, is that it's going to spontaneously, this is the, the symmetry breaking, the whole idea between symmetry breaking, is that the system has got to choose one or the other state as you pull it down. So the system is going to go, of course, for you, on average, it's going to be equally likely to be in one of the two states. But in any particular run, in reality, there will be something in the environment which will discriminate one of them even by a little bit. Okay? There, never, there is no degeneracy in this universe, okay? because it's never the same. And so in some sense, you're going to be discriminating between these two, and that's, that's the well-known concept of, of symmetry rate. Um, so here you see that a quantum phase transition really is a phase transition uh, between an entangled state and a disentangled state. So you can really use entanglement, the amount of entanglement as your order parameter. Uh, and, and in this case, there is a sharp change. You know, this will be one unit of entanglement, if you like, and beyond this point, it really drops down to, to zero. And this is why I said yesterday that some people believe that entanglement might be Certainly as good an order parameters as anything else, as magnetization, but it might even be better in some examples, which I'll try to give you uh, a bit later on. So now the other point I was making there is that, um, so in, in a way, what people would like to, to do is the following. In the same way that we use symmetries in classical physics to talk about different phases of matter. So I've got face center cubic structure, body center cubics, or whatever else you have in solid state, I don't even remember anymore. But basically, all of these different phases of matter, the question is, can we do the same as far as entanglement is concerned? So can I talk about different properties of matter at zero temperature? Of course, at low temperature, there is no zero temperature. In terms of different entangled states that I've got as ground states there. So can I, can I say, this type of entanglement is a W state, therefore, my solid behaves like that. And that would be really cool. Then entanglement would really become an open parameter in the same way. And you can classify solids according to the to the ground state and we can't do that at the moment. But that's that's one of those dreams we have. Another point that I made yesterday is that imagine you are sitting here. So imagine that um, that your ground state, imagine that your that your ground state is a separable state. But now imagine I'm allowed to ramp up the temperature a little bit. Then, if the if the first excited state is a is a is a singlet state, I will actually, for a certain range of temperatures, generate an entangled state because now I will have a mixture of zero zero and the, and and the singlet state. So I will have something like uh, one minus epsilon zero zero plus epsilon whatever this epsilon is psi minus. The other states get mixed in as well, but let's say they're they're far apart in, in a way that I don't have to worry about it. That means my J is big in some sense. 
And basically, this guy will now be entangled. And of course, if you continue to increase the temperature, you will lose this kind of energy. So you can use disorder, you can use noise um, uh, to increase entanglement as well. And this, I think, has been a topic that's been explored very heavily now, especially in biological systems, because biological systems are warm and wet, as people say, so they're very different to solid state physics. And there, the temperature could actually play a, a positive role. And that would be really surprising. If certain things would not happen unless you had temperature. Certain coherent transfers would not happen. I think that's a really nice idea. It may be completely wrong as well, but I think it's very nice. Um, so, so I think this, this, more or less, uh, this more or less is the summary of, of what we talked about yesterday. Now, a really nice example, which I will just uh, briefly discuss now, is, 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 is found in superconductivity. And I think this is going to capture bosonic and fermionic systems all in one, and it's going to capture the uh, spatial entanglement as well as internal entanglement, all within one system. Now you will see the trade-offs there, and you can discuss is this for real, and are there some issues with that, and so on. So, um, so something like condens I, yeah, I mean, um, condensation of Cooper pairs would be the name. Um, so, I think I'm gonna discretize the whole. So. In, you know, this, this would happen inside a piece of metal. Um, and you would, you would have some finite, uh, finite domain, you would be reducing the temperature, and then you would start to observe certain interesting features like uh, current without resistance and so on. Um, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to discretize the whole thing just to make it easier for you to follow. So instead of having a box, I'm going to really discretize it into modes. Um, and so it's, it's a little bit like an optical lattice you know about it superimposed on top of a post condensate and really having a well-defined range of minima. And now I'm saying um, I can have electrons um, localized within each of these uh, each of these centers. And in fact, this is not a bad model for high temperature superconductivity. For long temperature, it's not so good problem. Um, so what I want is somehow to to get to get a post condensate of electrons. I can't do it with electrons alone because they're fermions. So you know, if I have one electron, I'm fine. What it would mean to have a condensate of one electron is basically to create an equal superposition of this electron being in all of the sites simultaneously. So cool it down so much that the wave function is as large as the box that you're talking about. So that's what it means, in other words, in, in the first quantization language. So, um, so this is all, all, all fine. So basically, in terms of modes, you'd be really writing it as the electron existing in the first slot and not existing anywhere else, plus electron existing in the second slot and, and, and nowhere else, and, and plus existing in the last slot. So you see these W states are a very natural description of your, of your system. I talked about them yesterday, and I said that the entanglement doesn't scale as strongly as it could actually scale. In fact, it scales so weakly that you can frequently ignore entanglement and get the Nobel Prize by ignoring it. So the mean field solution is the one that, that gives you the Nobel Prize for superconductivity. You don't need to do it in the fully quantum way. That's what's interesting. Because entanglement scales only as the log, log n, where n is the number of slots now. Okay. And now you ask yourself, what happens if I put another electron in? And of course, if you put another electron in, uh, you're going to run into trouble in the sense that uh, these guys really uh, cannot occupy the same state. So if I try to if I try to create another electron with exactly the same profile, this would have to go down to zero. So I mean, at the, at the formal level, imagine I'm creating an electron in the first site. Plus, in this this is now the second quantized way of writing this down an electron in the end site act, acting on the vacuum state. This vacuum state is the state with zeros in all modes. Okay, it's just a shorthand notation. This is now the same as that. And now I'm saying, what if I put another electron, square, but square of any fermionic operator is zero, because they're anti-commute, um, or because they're electrons. I'm, I'm using a typical theoretician's language and confusing the cause and effect. This is, you know, Electrons behave the way they do, that's why I'm telling you that it is described in this way. It's not, it's not the other way around. Anyhow, in order to avoid this, Cooper said, what if they came as pairs? 
what if there was some kind of interaction, a little bit like the one we are using here, that would actually naturally form pairs of, <coughs> of electrons in a state like that. It would have to be a state like that because they, they have to be anti -symmetries. So Cooper said, what if I had an electron in the state up here and another one in the state down? So this is up, down, minus, down, uh, down, up, symmetry. Then you'd be fine. Uh, so so what, if, what, if instead of, what if instead of spreading one electron, I now spread a Cooper pair across all of these guys? Is it going to be easier? The logic behind that is that because each of these operators anti-commutes, when, when they anti-commute in pairs, I do everything an even number of times. And two minuses are a plus, actually. So a pair, in some sense, and I'll show you in which sense this is, behaves like a bosonic particle. It's not a bosonic particle, but it, in some sense it does behave a little bit, but <coughs> not completely. So Cooper said, so in a real superconductor, they're not actually sitting in the same spot. There is a coherence like something like 100 microns, I think. So they're separated by that much. Uh, if you go to high temperature superconductors, they are basically something like a nanometer apart. So you can really assume they occupy the same physical location, which is why they need to be anti symmetric So it's actually the same kind of interaction that leads to a Cooper pen. Okay? So it's a nice illustration of that. So now Cooper says, what if in site one I've got an electron up and in the same site, I've got an electron down. Now I'm creating a pair. A pair is my unit. OK, you can superpose this as well. So basically, two up. This already is a single state. You see, this is the beauty of second quantization formalism. I don't have to write minus down up. It's already anti-symmetrized by the defi definition of these operators. So there are all the advantages of this kind of language. Anyhow, two down and so on, a n dagger up, a n. So now I'm forcing two electrons in one state. And so it's the same state as this, but, but one now represents a Cooper pair. One represents a pair of electrons in the state up, down. So they're maximally entangled, but they're sitting on top of each other. See, that's the problem. Is this entanglement? OK, take your pick. I mean, remember all the discussions, and it's, it's as difficult as that. But basically, there is one unit of entanglement. They are really like diamonds. Each pair is somehow disentangled from, from other pairs, if you like. And, and, and so now what happens if I insert another pair and I square this guy? Um, well, what happens now is that the pair behaves like a bosonic particle. So they're not going to annihilate between the sides. But what's still true is that there are electrons to start with. So you cannot put another pair into the slot where the first pair exists. It's just there is no way of doing that. They're still fermionic particles. So in that sense, they are not bosonic particles. This is frequently misunderstood. But what I can do is I can introduce a pair in another slot. So now you can see what happens is that my state becomes a W state with two ones, two Cooper pairs, if you like. I'm going to get tired with writing all these arrows and everything. So one now means a pair of electrons. But now symmetrized over all possible um, states. So something like that. So this is really a W state with, with two ones and the rest are zeros. Uh, and so on, up to the last one, if you like. Uh, one, one, OK? So there is no problem with squaring. It's not going to go to zero, the whole wave function. That's my point. In that sense, they are bosonic. But still, you cannot have two in one slot. You can't have two pairs of electrons because one pair exhausts all the possibilities. They are fermionic particles. What happens if you put another pair? Um, you just get the same thing with three in all possible slots. Four and so on, you raise it to the power of n. Okay? Um, if you raise it to the power of n, see? What I'm describing now happens to be probably one of the hottest areas of research in condensed matter physics, especially when you, when you start to look at simulations of these systems with cold, cold atoms. If you have as many pairs as the sites, 
these guys can't conduct anymore. It's what we know as a mod instrument. So basically, each of these slots now is filled with a pair, and they can't move around. Because for one pair to move around, it has to be able to hop to another point. They can't hop. The point is already occupied by something else. So in fact, the best state in terms of conductivity, as well as in terms of entanglement, that's an interesting point, is 50-50. Do it half filling. Do uh, n over 2 pairs of electrons. Then half of these guys are empty, half are full, and now they can hop like crazy. And in fact, the current itself is your entanglement witness as well as your other parameter and anything else you like. And that's an interesting point. So now, it's a trade-off between each of these pairs being in a singlet state internally. That's the amount of entanglement that matters as far as forming a pair is concerned. Now, once you accept that this one represents a pair, the entanglement that matters is not this entanglement. This entanglement is irrelevant. It doesn't make any, any difference. In fact, it could be triplet state. Some people believe that there is a triplet based on conductivity. It doesn't have to be entanglement at all. But what matters internally? What matters is that spatially, it's in a W state like that. So what matters is that you have a huge coherence over all electron pairs. And this coherence is as large as the system itself. It stretches. It's, a grand, it's one of those other parameters in a way. It's, it's a grand wave function that describes the whole condensate of, of Cooper pairs. So spatial entanglement, again, is the one that scales that scales roughly as log, as log n. So I'll show you that in a, in a minute, actually. I want to do a little bit of calculations of that type as well. And now some people, some people start to question these things. First of all, is the statement that this is spatially entangled really a correct statement? Can I, can I do something with that spatial entanglement? Can I teleport with spatial entanglement? Can I compute and things like that? The second statement is, is it even entangled internally? Does that make any sense? And there is a clinching argument uh, that it is entangled internally. Especially the issues are tricky and they go back to this massive particle entanglement that I discussed yesterday. Can you do certain rotations in this, in this space? So can I convert an empty site into a site which contains one Cooper pair coherently superposed with no Cooper pair? Can you do that? I don't know if you can do it. If you cannot do it, it's not entangled. If you can, it is entangled. It's as, as simple as that. Now, if you accept, if, if really the Cooper pair, if, if the particles are sitting on top of each other, it may really be difficult to separate them and to talk about it. But in general, they're not really on top of each other. So in a real, in a real conductor, like as a superconductor, in real means normal, not, not high temperature. These guys are separated by something like micrometers. So, you know, up, down, down, up. And what people can do and actually was done recently. Someone told me that this was done recently. I know at least three groups competing to achieve this result. I have actually no idea. I'm yet to find the paper and, and then see who did it. But the interesting thing is what they do is they, they look at, uh, at the surface of a superconductor. And people are very good these days at, at uh, engineering nanotubes. So they have these usual buckyballs or carbon uh, structures which they can they can really make into a tube. And the point is that the diameter of this tube is a nanometer. So the size of the tube is 1,000 times smaller, or 100 times, whatever you take there as a unit, smaller than the separation between Cooper pairs. So what I'm saying now is that I'm going to satisfy condition number one for entanglement, which means I have Alice and Bob. I can identify two subsystems. So what they do is they, they take a nanotube. In fact, um, uh, they take a nanotube like that, which looks a little bit like a fork. Okay, you can do these things. It's, 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 a, it's basically like anything in solid state physics. It's, it's subject to huge amount of trial and error. How to even make these guys? You have to try it a zillion times, but every once in a while you get lucky and you got the right nanotubes. Now you insert them inside, and you try to catch the Cooper pairs, which move in the opposite direction. So basically, you want this guy to end up in this tube, and you want this guy to end up in this tube. This is the solid state electron equivalent of down conversion with two photons. 
I'm now extracting two electrons in a highly entangled internal state in the same way that two photons are generated from a piece is in fact the same state. So, so why, why do they go like this? Well, they go like this because they are electrons and it's highly unlikely the two electrons will squeeze through the same small area because they don't like each other, they tend to avoid each other. So that's why they actually do go in and there's a high chance that they will split in a separate way. And what you can do now, for example, if you ask how do you confirm that they're entangled. So this type of entanglement now, you can separate them as far as you like, one meter if you like. And now you can do all sorts of experiments like teleportation, dense coding, uh, entanglement swapping, you name it with these kind of guys. You can repeat all the optics that's been done in the last 15 years. And I think that's what people are starting to do now. So for example, one of my proposals, and I was hoping that the group that I was consulting would do this, so we get uh, a nice nature paper out of it, but I think it's tough luck that someone else has already done it. Well, I don't know how much they've done, but what I would like them to do is the following, the simplest case, is recombine them, make an interferometer. So recombine these arms, and look at the output, do they bunch or anti-bunch here? And depending on the ratio of bunching to anti-bunch, so basically do they click one in each detector, or do they end up two in one detector and two in the other. Depending on the ratio of these things, you will be able to tell how much in a singlet state they were to start with. And if you tell me the fidelity of the singlet state, fidelity of sing so fidelity of the singlet is basically the difference between unbunching and anti-bunching. And if you tell me this, and if you show me that it's greater than a half, then I know that the state here was an entangled state. That's it. It's as good a proof as anything else. It's not a bad inequality quite, but actually it's, it's the first step in that, in that direction. So apparently this used to be just a, a dream five or six years ago. Now people can already do stuff like that. Now you just need to, I mean just, you just need another pair of these guys and you're starting to entanglement swap. You're starting to do serious stuff with these things. So, so that's, the, that's the direction. So no doubt that this is entanglement. Whoever tells you otherwise, doesn't know about these things, okay? So this spatial entanglement on the other hand is a bit trickier, like I said, but certainly internally these guys are, these guys are definitely entangled. Maybe before, before I start a new topic, I want to, I want to make a, a small break. But before I do that, how, how do people calculate the amount of entanglement in a state like that? I think I just mentioned it briefly yesterday. What you try to do is you try, so imagine one of those states where you've got um, one, one, and two zeros. Just a simple, the simplest example that captures all of these guys. So what you're trying to do is find a product state. So in solid state, this is known as mean field theory. That would look as close as possible like this guy without having correlations. So what would you do? Well, you would look at the ratio of zeros and ones and you would say, I've got two zeros to a one. I mean, the probability, no, this is equal, okay? It is equal because of the symmetry that they all have to be, it has to be the same state under all permutations. So basically, if you look at this, the, if you're forced to describe it locally, you would do something like this. You would say with probability two thirds, I've got a zero, and with probability one third, I've got a one for every qubit. That's the Nobel Prize winning solution I was talking about. It's good enough to capture the whole of thermodynamics. Yet, it's not good enough to capture entanglement because I, I, by default, I killed it deliberately. So there is, a, there is a difference, big difference between those. So if you do this for every qubit, you will really get a state that you can prove. So what, what you need to prove is that no other combination of zeros and ones can have a higher fidelity with this state than this guy. So I'm going to do an inner product between, between the, the product state and the, and the state, let's call it size, so I minimize my, my writing. And basically what you want is this to be as big as possible. Uh, and, and then entanglement is, is simply the reciprocal of that. Because if I can make this very high, that means that my state is not very entangled. It's very close to a product state. So entanglement goes in the opposite direction, which is why you take the log of one divided by that, which is the same as minus sign in front. It's the same logic always, one over the probability, log of one over the probability. Um, so this state is the one that captures 
all of the macroscopic observables modular, then you are really ignoring entanglement. But entanglement in the limit, entanglement per particle goes down to zero in the thermodynamical limit, so you don't need to worry about it. That's the logic there. Although I claim that there is entanglement and you can detect it so So I think that's, that's one of those examples where where we can calculate global entanglement. It's a really nice state if you want to learn a little bit about it because it's highly symmetric. So it's easy to construct mean field theory and things like that. And so what I'll be doing um, after the break is I'll try to, I'll try to show you how we might, want, uh, we might want to use these states to try to compute. So the question is, given that I'm given this for free, it's just sitting there in thermal equilibrium. I don't have to invest anything to do that. Can I now start doing something intelligent? to get this guy to, to compute for us. And the answer is yes, you can. So that's master state quantum computing. So let's make a 10 minute break. <laughs> Continuing the discussion, I, I'll, I'll make one, one brief comment. It's difficult to read, but I'll make it in words. Uh, I'll make one brief comment just to show you an indication why, why we think that maybe entanglement could be uh, a useful order parameter. Uh, so, in order, like I said, in order to convince a solid state physicist that this is, this is a good thing, um, you, you need to show that, that what they traditionally use and what they use for, for um, um, for criticality is really two-point correlation function. So you would do, use some kind of long-range order. You know, you would say if I compute if I compute correlations between uh, point one, let's use site one uh, in my in my formulation there, and site n, and if I look at the average of this guy as n tends to infinity for large n for large domain or, or superconductor, then this guy stays finite. It doesn't go to zero. Uh, and that's what defines a, a wave function, an order parameter. This is, by definition, the mod psi squared, if you like, of the condensate. So going from the second quanta, so this guy creates a Cooper pair in one, this guy annihilates a Cooper pair in n. And the question is, are these two actions correlated? Is me killing something here going to create something over there? That's normal locality for you, right, in, in, in solid state language. And if it is, then this means that this is going to be a finite number as n goes to infinity. Again, n never goes to infinity. It goes to one meter most or whatever it does. But I mean, that's, that's, that's the idea. And, and so now, that's what justifies attributing a, a grand wave function to one billion atoms, is the fact that there is a global coherence across the whole condensate. So this is a solid state or the parameter. Okay. In magnetic systems, this would look something like <coughs> flip a spin, uh, sigma plus, create a, you know, a flip a spin from down to up at point one, and, and flip a spin down at point n. And the question again is whether this is a, a positive number or not. And if it is, you are in the ordered phase. If it's not, you are in the disordered, you are above that, and so on. So here is what solid state physics is like. Uh, but now, can we show that there are, there are phases which you would consider physically to be ordered because you can see some properties, something happens that's not, not completely defaced, and yet all of these guys go to zero. They never give you anything meaningful. And then you come up with entanglement, you say, look, entanglement is not zero. Here, yeah, that's it, okay? So we don't have really examples of, of this type. But here is an interesting, here is an interesting example. Again, I don't know if it relates to any physics or not. These states are the states in question. So basically, these are naturally occurring states. And, and what happens, if you look at the typical, uh, typical um, eigenstates of, uh, of, of, a, of a complex system, you would get some kind of W states with different number of ones uh, and zeros. So it's not unlikely at all that you will, you will have a state like this mixed in with a I mean, again, I'm talking about three sides, if you like, but you can, you can extrapolate the idea. Uh, a state like this mixed in with a state like that, two ones and one zero. So even in a single 
even in a single ground state, if you take n spins and you trace out n minus 3 spins, the 3 spins that you have will be in a mixture, in an equal mixture of a type like that. Okay, so you'll be mixing W states. And the question is, what kind of properties does this have? Um, so basically, W state with 1, um, 1, 1, if you call this W1, if you like, mixed in with W2 and W3 and so on. The question is, what kind of, uh, what kind of properties does this have? And I actually lost a bet uh, on, on this one. It's interesting, but I got a PRL out of it, so it's okay. It's a, it's a, it's a good news at the end. So they still included me even though I was against the idea. So the interesting thing about these states is the following. It sounds unbelievable, but it's true. Compute any three-point correlation function. I mean, that's all you can compute because I'm giving you three spins. It generalizes to any number of spins, by the way. So basically, take x, x, x combination. Measure sigma x on each of these guys. Now measure x, x, z, x, x, y, and so on. All Basically, the number of combinations is three operators here, if you like, times three here. So all the way down to z, 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 all correlation functions. That's what a solid state physicist would do. A solid state physicist would say, let me measure them all, and if something is non-zero, I'm excited. It's an order. But if all of them go to zero, and they do, by the way, for this state, it's a boring thing. So here we go. All of these guys are zero. And the question that that we asked some time ago was, can it be that this state is still entangled even though all correlation functions go to zero? All three-point correlation functions go to zero. And of course, my answer was no way. Okay? And the answer is yes, it can be, of course. So here is the interesting point. If you try to ask the same question for two qubits, you can never do this. So if I tell you that all two-point correlation functions are gone, Okay, everything down to ZZ. This state cannot have any entanglement between these two qubits. It's just it's described by a density matrix for one times the density matrix for the other one. But there is no way that there are any correlations, even forget entanglement. This implies a state like that. There are no correlations. Amazingly enough, if you do this at the next level up for three qubits, this doesn't imply that at all. You can actually have entanglement. Not only that, you can have a genuine three party entanglement. So this guy, you can prove, is not a state where any of the qubits can be separated from the other. So here I'm assuming that row 1 may be separated from row 2, 3. You can also add to that that row 2 can be separated from row 1, 3, and so on. This state is not a state of this form. None of the three qubits can be separated, I mean, and then mixtures of such states from the other two. This means it's a genuine three-party entangled state. It's really at that level entangled. And yet, all of the three-point correlation functions are zero. When I said this to Tony Leggett, he also said, no way. Okay, so the intuition really is, even if you have a Nobel Prize, that this cannot be done. And that's what's interesting. So I was in the good club, but we lost him again. But I think it was a good club to be. And, and like I said, you can go to n particles and prove the same thing. And of course, one million dollar question is, the question here is, is this, does this correspond to an ordered physical phase? Does a system in a state like that superconduct? Is it magnetic? Does it have vortices or whatever else you consider an ordered state? And the answer is I have no clue. Okay, so that's again a missing link. But you can see that entanglement can actually tell you something that, that correlations func correlation functions are insufficient to do. Okay, now what do we do with this guy? And I think that's what I want to mention briefly now. So the exciting thing is that using these condensed matter techniques, we can really start to talk about computing now. And the idea really came from, from two people, Rausendorf and Riegel. And this is a long time ago now, it's almost 10 years ago. And they said in a very simple way the following. They said, imagine, um, well, they didn't quite say it like this, but I think they um, they, it was distilled to something like that in the, in the ultimate understanding. And I think it's easier to look at it like this. They said, imagine I've, I've given a many-body entangled state. And now, what I really want to do is I want to make only one qubit measurement. Why? 
Because if I engage anything that requires more than one qubit, that's usually considered difficult. So making a control knot or even more complicated like control, control knot gates is actually much more difficult. So what they said is, can I use the initial entanglement in the simplest possible way? And the simplest way is just to make measurements. That's very incoherent. You don't need to maintain coherence to do measurements. And on top of it, I'm allowed to make single qubit rotations as well. And the question is, can I exploit this entanglement to perform computation? And the surprising answer was that, yes, you can do that, given that you have the right state. And the intuition goes like this. You know that if you have a perfectly entangled pair, you can teleport. Now, if you can teleport a state, an input state psi, from here to here, if you didn't perform corrections, or if you did different corrections on the state, so remember, for teleportation, you need to measure these guys. And depending on the outcome of the measurement, you need to do something to this guy. But imagine, instead of doing these corrections here to get the state psi, you just do it corrections to get a different state. So for example, you remember that if we started with a state A0 plus B1, you sometimes end up with a state A0 minus B1, which is actually sigma Z applied to the original state. And imagine I consider this to be the successful teleportation. Then what I've actually done is I didn't just teleport, but I teleported the unitary transformation because sigma Z is a unitary transformation. So the intuition is you can use one unit of entanglement, not just to teleport the state, but to teleport something else on the other side, which is a unitary transformed version of this state. Admittedly, with one pair, you cannot do a general unitary transformation. And I think this now starts to introduce a many body idea into the whole game. So, so the question now is, OK, that's really nice. I do one teleportation, and I can do sigma z. Now, what if I want to do sigma x? And what if I want to do sigma y? What if I want to make, make a general on the block sphere? Well, you can see that you need three different things, complementary things to achieve that. So basically, it's clear that in some sense, you need another unit of entanglement and then another unit of entanglement. So here, I'll be teleporting something like z. Here, I'll be doing something like, like x. Well, x on z already on, 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 on psi. And then I can do something like y or whatever else. So in some sense, if I could teleport once, and then use this result to teleport again, and then use this result to teleport again, I'd be actually doing computation on a single qubit just by making a sequence of teleportations. And that's roughly the idea behind cluster states. The only difference now is that you don't need a sequence of dimers. And that's actually a bad news, because a sequence of dimers really occurs naturally. It would be nice if it was like that. But it's a different differently entangled state, although it has the same amount of entanglement. And you can see why you need dimers, because you're doing uh, an extended teleportation. So the cluster state cannot be separated in this way. So you save up. In, instead of thinking of these two as two qubits, you really merge them into one qubit. The best way of doing that is somehow to project onto the singlet and the triplet basis. So in a way, you can convert dimers into, into, into the right state. And this state is called the cluster state, if you like, by, by thinking of a projection onto singlet and triplet. So you're creating a qubit out of two qubits, and then another qubit out of two qubits, and so on. This construction already exists in the condensed method, actually. It's studied uh, in its own right. So now, now you've got a state that's really entangled across. You cannot separate any, anything. No qubit is really separable from, from the rest of the qubit. And now if you start making single qubit measurements, you can really get the rest of the qubits to implement some kind of unitary transformation as a result of that. And it's exactly propagating the information further. What you have to allow, and so that's trick number one, is you have to allow measurements in at least two complementary bases. And for historical reasons, these are the x and z measurements. But you can relabel them x and y or z and y. Every, anything will do the job. In fact, if you want to be really completely general, you will allow the whole block sphere and orient yourself in any direction. That's also fine, actually. But you don't need to do that. In addition to choosing, choosing the basis, Exactly like in teleportation, you need to communicate the outcome to the next stage. So basically, if you get a plus result here, uh, you need to say, OK, I've got plus, if you like. And now I'm going to adjust what I measure here. 
So there is a feed for, forward necessity for exactly the same reason as you need to communicate between Alice and Bob in teleportation. If you mix all of the outcomes, you will never get, you will get a maximum mixed state, actually. So the idea is, I start, um, I start with something like n qubits. I sacrifice half of these qubits to do measurements. But then the remaining half of the qubits just implement whatever unitary transformation you want to do. And this is very interesting. Um, and and the, the most interesting part was to show that if you have a two-dimensional cluster like that, I'll, say, I'll tell you in a minute how this is actually made. If you have a two-dimensional cluster like that, so think of the dimers that you're connecting, but now in 2D, if you like. So not, not, only, not only lines like that, but connect them by gates. I, I will mention what this means. Uh, connect them in, 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 the, in the vertical direction as well. Then you have, a, then you have something that's as good as, as the universal Turing machine and the circuit model in terms of its power to compute. So whatever you can efficiently compute in, 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 in any model of quantum computation, you can also do in a two-dimensional cluster state. Um, one D is not enough. That's interesting also. It sounds a little bit like the proof that I was offering yesterday that there is no criticality in one D, but you have to move to two D to get to get a critical uh, to get a phase transition. And this has been a, a long-term idea as well. Hey, no one has really been able to capture it properly. I should say. Can you really show that? Cluster state quantum computation is like a phase transition in some sense. I'll show you what we can do with that. But, but basically, can you really think of, of this not being universal and this being universal as a kind of uh, as a kind of phase transition? Of course, anything in higher dimensions uh, than two, you can always reduce to two dimensions. So there is no problem. It's, it's immediately universal in, in, in every higher dimension. Um, so. Um, Okay, so, so what, is the, what, what are the advantages of this model? The one advantage of this model is really that uh, the claim is that entanglement only sits in the initial state. And the whole computation is actually a sequence of destroying entanglement. And every time you destroy a unit of entanglement, you gain a unit of computation. You gain a gate, exactly like that. You implement the sigma z, but you kill one, one diamond. You implement sigma x, you kill another Diamond. In this way, you're killing these links as you are measuring, but you're gaining you're gaining gates. Um, and and so so that's the way that it, the model was solved is that you do all the hard work at the beginning. You create all the entanglement. All you have to do afterwards is single qubit measurements, which which are almost like the environment measuring these qubits. In a way, that would happen even if you didn't want it to happen. So all you have to do is destroy entanglement, but in, in half, let's say in half of the cluster. And then the rest of the cluster will somehow contain your output uh, of, the, of the quantum computation. Okay? So it was sold in that way. Imagine nature gives you this for free. Unfortunately, it doesn't. There are no cluster states as eigenstates of natural Hamiltonians. You can prove that. It. So it's, it's a bad news, actually. Nature doesn't give you cluster states for free. But imagine if it did, then I've got even entanglement for free. All I have to now be able to do is measure this guy and drive it in the right direction, like in teleportation. So the bad news number one is that there are no naturally occurring cluster states. I'll give you a little bit of that logic now. The, the second bad news is the following. So wh what I'm trying to say is that, again, following the principle of conservation of trouble, when, whenever you come up with, a, with an idea that's very different to the previous idea, and it looks like you're overcoming the problems of the previous idea, like you don't have to do gates, you don't have to do things like complicated things like that. The, the trouble then arises in other departments. So department number one is you don't get this for free in nature. Depart the trouble number two is even if you did, this would be this would be presumably an equilibrium state you'd be talking about. Let's say you cool your system down and the ground state is the cluster state. Now you start measuring. The trouble is if you have lots of systems in lots of subsystems in equilibrium, they will tend to go back to equilibrium state super fast. If you have a complex system, you achieve equilibrium in 10 to minus 20 seconds. Okay, this is like the usual argument for classicality emerging out of quantum. 
So that means your measurements for your computation have to be super fast. Because as you are measuring it, it means you're taking it out of equilibrium. And nature is going to try to drive it back to the initial state as fast as possible. So can your measurements now compete with the natural thermalization of these states? I have no idea. Probably the answer is no, actually. So probably this implementation is as bad as the others, if not even worse. But for a theoretician, it's a really cute example, and, and you can study. So it's not clear, actually, how good, how good this will be ultimately. Um, now, um, what I wanted, what I wanted to talk about a little bit is, is, is how, how to view these cluster states as, um, as natural recurring states. Wow, there's a celebration of something. Uh, so, so if you dynamically, you can really prepare them easily. But then you will see that, that, the, that the price really is, is in the initial preparation. So let's not think of it as a, as a naturally occurring state in thermal equilibrium. Let's think about it, I have, to, I have to do it myself at the beginning. So I'm given, I'm given qubits. And, and first of all, I have to be able to do Hadamard gates and put them in the, again, for historical reasons, it was phrased like this, but it doesn't have to be phrased like this. Uh, you've got plus state, 0, plus 1 in each of the qubits. And now what you do is a control phase gate between every uh, nearest neighbor pair. It's phrased in this way because control phase gate comes from the sigma z, <coughs> sigma z Hamiltonian. If you exponentiate this Hamiltonian, and that's your natural NMR Hamiltonian, for example, then, then you will be implementing a gate where the 1, 1 uh, state somehow gets a minus sign phase and all the other states don't up to a, 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 a local transformation. So if I implement a control phase, if I implement this guy, um, then, then basically between every two qubits, then the resulting state is one of those states that we call the cluster state. So this guy now in 2D, so if you do that between every, every nearest neighbor, you will get, you will get a cluster state. Um, uh, that's capable of universal computation. And now all you have to do is start measuring it. And measurements really determine what kind of evolution the rest of the state. So whether you will do x, z, x, or whichever combination really depends on what kind of output you want here. And there is a one-to-one -one mapping between dynamics and, uh, and this kind of uh, execution. So from this picture, you see where the price to pay is. The price to pay is basically in the initial preparation. The way that the paper was written was to argue intelligently that frequently this is given to you for free. So in NMR, your spins couple in this way even if you don't want them to couple. You don't have the choice. They are always on, these interactions. So somehow, it shouldn't be that difficult to drive your system to a, to a cluster state of that type. That's the logic. And now the question is, Given that these interactions are always on, can I now switch them off and start making measurements without this guy being on? So that's, that's another, again, it's the same problem that I discussed before, but in, in the dynamical setting. And this is not resolved. I don't know the answer to this question. Um, so now, um, how about statically? What, what kind of Hamiltonian would you have to write down to generate a state like this? And what I said before, is that in nature we typically get two body uh, interactions. We don't really get three or higher body interactions. And the trouble is that a cluster state really requires, requires um, a three body interaction. So basically this would, this would result in, let's call it, psi uh, cluster. And it turns out that there is another way of, of phrasing this whole thing, which is to say that cluster states are eigenstates of triplets of operators of this type. So if you apply x to, well, i spin, z to i plus first, and x to i plus second, and this is true now for all i, you scan the whole, the whole cluster state, then cluster states are basically eigenstates of, 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 this, uh, of, this, of this sequence of operations. So in a sense, some people call this a stabilizer formalism because this state does not change. It's stabilized, if you like, under, under operations x, z, x. Okay? So in fact, it's very simple to see one Hamiltonian that does the job immediately, and the Hamiltonian is just, is just there. So basically, if I say 
my Hamiltonian is minus, I'm putting the minus sign because I want the guy to be the ground state. I want to cool my system down into the cluster state. So if I sum over all i's, and if I have x i, z i plus 1, x i plus 2, so I'm switching between, between this notation, this is the same as z z, I'm just using two different notations for God knows what reason. So basically, this guy is really a triplet, pro, you know, triple product of Pauli matrices. If you look at this guy, then Hamiltonian acting on the cluster state is simply minus n, n is just the number of sides, spins. Minus n times the cluster state and it's the lowest, <coughs> lowest state you can achieve. Okay. And what we do now is you say, aha, what's the spectrum of this guy? So you see, it would be nice if nature gave you this kind of Hamiltonian because then the eigenstates would be naturally universal computers under, under single qubit gates. Um, but basically, this, this, is not really, this is not really the case. Um, and um, so you can get it. Imagine that the nature gives you a Hamiltonian like that, j times you know, nearest neighbors. And imagine that there was an external field in the x direction as well. Okay? So something like, again, on every spin i. Imagine there is a Hamiltonian like that. There probably is something that resembles this. Um, what, what you would do then is if you compute the next order perturbation, so you think of one of these guys as small with respect to the other one, you expand and see what is the next order that you need to take into account, then it's going to involve products of these guys. And once you have products of these guys, you can see that x, z, x will start to appear. And so again, it's the, just a reformulation of the fact that, that this guy will in fact be much less likely to occur than, than the two-body interactions. And you can do it like that. There are proposals of, of this type. Okay, now imagine we have the Hamiltonian as a perturbation or whatever else you can do. What's the next level up? The next level up is a state where you acted by one sigma z on the cluster state. What that does is flips plus to minus. Okay? So Z gate operating on plus gives you minus, and operating on minus, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's the same as sigma x operating on zeros and ones, basically, in this case. And what this does is, is, is so you can really think of a cluster state as an ordered state. And then you start to apply sigma z's, and that flips some of these spins, and you're starting to climb up the, the spectrum of these guys. So basically, Z applied to any of the, of the spins in the cluster will give you something with the energy. So Z applied to J on psi C. And if you act on this with a Hamiltonian, it will have, sorry, it will have the energy one unit higher. I mean, the unit depends on the strength here. I could have put some J if you like. So basically, this is one unit of energy higher than the ground state. There's an M4 degeneracy. And now you go to states where you apply two of these guys. That's the next level up. And these guys have, um, these guys have um, one more unit of energy and so on. It's an equi equidistant spectrum. It's a simple spectrum. Okay? So you've got the ground state, cluster state. Then you've got an M4 degeneracy of Z on acting on cluster. Then you've got another N squared, in a way, degeneracy of ZZ acting on the cluster state and so on. All of these are separated equal. That's your spectrum. Okay. Uh, yes. So when I apply Z, is it the tangent state of the Hamiltonian? Because when I apply it there, it's not the eigenstate state of the Hamiltonian anymore when I apply the Z again. Is it X. I should be applying X. You're right. Okay. Yes. Yes. Yes, it's formulated. That's why you have to be careful with the literature. Sometimes it's formulated as ZXZ, in which case you'd be doing what I did there, actually. If you phrase it like that, you should apply X in the complementary basis. Otherwise, you don't get anything, of course. You have to flip the speeds in the, the complementary basis. So now, once you have this spectrum, you can really start to ask questions. First of all, I can calculate the amount of entanglement in this guy. And then I can say, how much do I have to heat the system up so that I lose the entanglement and so on? And all of these are very, very interesting questions. And actually, one, one interesting point, for example, is that as you start to heat the system, uh, the system up, 
uh, in, in this state, you will reach a point where your witness of entanglement, so your witness of entanglement will be, uh, one of the witnesses I mentioned is the entropy of the state has to be smaller than the entanglement in the ground state. Again, I'll discuss this issue in a moment. There's, uh, there's another very interesting point, and probably I'm going to conclude on that topic because that's the most recent statement that we have on these lines. But basically, the, if, you, if you compute this kind of stuff, then the critical temperature you get uh, is exactly the same as the 2D icing critical temperature. It's the one I was talking about yesterday, and it's exactly the same number. And again, it's, it's really mysterious that, that somehow there are so many parallels between the order in, in condensed matter and these guys. So you can think of the ground state as being good for computation, containing the right amount of entanglement, and then you can think of heating the guy up until you destroy entanglement, presumably beyond that point you should not have any, uh, any, any computational powers. So, so I want to say a little bit about the entanglement in these guys because it's a very interesting, it's a very interesting topic. Um, entanglement, so entanglement basically in clusters. There's, a, there's, a, there's one, one point that's very counterintuitive and I, I, ba I basically alluded to that point very briefly yesterday. So from the analysis so far, if you ask how many how, how many units of entanglement do I have in a, in a cluster state? The answer would be n over 2, because the cluster state is equivalent to a bunch of diamonds. So if I really gave you a bunch of diamonds like that, and then I connected them by some kind of transformation here, like a C phase gate, exactly as, as here, then each of these guys would have one unit of entanglement. It's a maximally entangled state. But I've got n over 2 pairs. So n over 2 times 1 unit is exactly the amount of entanglement that you get. So some, somehow that's OK. It, it seems like it makes, it makes sense that this is, um, this is the amount of entanglement that we, that we need. The trouble, and, and here is where the, the counterintuitive nature of these, of these states uh, comes in. And it's simply, I think, the fee, all the features come, come from the fact that you're really allowing only single qubit measurements to be made here. So that's the tricky bit. I really do not want anything. No entanglement creation is allowed after the initial, the initial preparation stage. So the first counterintuitive statement is that I said yesterday this is not the maximum. So this is less than E max, which actually is N minus log N or like. Much higher than that. It approaches N for large N. And if I claim all the time, so you see, in this picture, there is a very beautiful correspondence between entanglement and computation. Namely, you have to have entanglement to do computation. Just like in teleportation, you cannot teleport without entanglement. Here, there is no question about whether you need it or not. It's built into the whole, into the whole scheme at the beginning. So this issue is, is not, not a question for plastic states. You need entanglement. But then you ask yourself, why, why only half of what I can actually have? Shouldn't then the analogy suggest that I need maximum entanglement? If I want to be the best I can be in terms of computing, and if you're telling me that one unit of entanglement equals one gate, shouldn't I be going all the way? So, you know, so this is basically two times the cluster entanglement. So why don't I give you all the twice as many units of entanglement? This is a little bit of a mystery. Well, I don't know whether what I have to say about it will clarify it any, any better than this. But it's, you see, it's a mystery because imagine I define. So here is the here is the tricky point. Imagine I define universality in this way. So now I'm going to be completely quantum quantum mechanical. I don't care about solving any problems, uh, factorizing any numbers. What I want is I want you to prepare a state for me at the end of your computation. So I want you to give me a given state. So you can see that my formulation is more general than any classical computing because it includes classical computing as a special case. So I want to give you a state. You do your measurements, whatever you need to do there on single qubits, and come back with a state that I want. State preparation is the most general question I can ask. And now, Single qubit measurements, they are local operations. And you remember that local operations cannot 
increase the amount of entanglement in a given state. They can decrease, they can kill it the way that these guys are killing it, but they can't increase it. Okay? So here is a problem for you. I give you a cluster state, and what I want is the output is one of those guys. Yesterday, by the way, I claimed that almost every state is this guy. This guy I can randomly prepare by random <coughs> gates. Random, that's how that's how, that's how ubiquitous they are, actually. They are always there with, with unit probability analysis. Can you do it? No, you cannot. Because local operations cannot double the amount of entanglement that you start with. Okay. So how come the state is universal? I've just given you a problem that you cannot solve. Interesting, right? If you define universality the way I did, that's, that's it. That's the end of plastic states, actually. So you have to define it as solving some kind of algorithm in the same way as dynamical computer does. So you have to be very careful. There are many definitions. And some of them will be a little bit detrimental to cluster states. Now the positive way of looking at this, and that's, that's kind of another surprising point. So the first surprise is it seems like maximum entanglement is not what you want. The second surprise, and this has a flavor of, of, of some of these proofs of, of um, Criticality. The second surprise is that it actually is bad for you. So now you may think, if I give you a state like this, I'm overdoing it. I'm giving you twice as much as you need for universal computation. But surely this is not bad for you. Okay? So if I give you a lot of entanglement, and I claim that you can do local operations, then you just do the operations, you destroy this amount of entanglement, you destroy one unit here. And you get back the cluster state, and now you do whatever you like to do. And the, the statement is you cannot do this, the cluster state formulation. That's really interesting. So the statement now, and I want to show you actually how this is reasoned a little bit. The statement is this, that if I give you one of those states, and if I ask you to stick to the rules of the game, that you can only measure one qubit at a time, in whatever basis you like, actually, and then you can update the information and so on, having the maximum entanglement is actually bad for you. You can't compute with that. You can do nothing with that. It's as useless as a maximum mean state. And that's a bit of a surprise. Okay. So the, there are unusual states. And I think all of these statements about them, I wouldn't look at this as telling us something about computation. I would look at this as telling us something about many body entanglement. That's the interest here, rather than can I really compute and so on. So why are they bad? So you know, this was sold in a grand way. That, that too much entanglement is also bad for you. But actually, too much entanglement is bad for you only because you're limiting yourself to single qubit measurement. In fact, too much entanglement is really too much. It burns you. That's how much you have. It's not that it's not enough to do computation. It really is too much because your powers are very limited in, in this formulation. So let me just show you roughly how this logic, this logic works. And it actually relates nicely to some of the me measures that we discussed before. So the logic is like this. Imagine I'm doing a sequence 